In other words, the fact that these laws apply to nature doesn't mean they have to apply to man and society. That's right. And we should positively work against them in shaping our own societies. In essence, that means that humans do have the capacity to, to, to rebel against their genes. Yes. It, 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 that's unique amongst animals. I think that's unique amongst animals, and that's another of the points that I make in the essay, A Devil's Chaplain. I actually concluded my first book, The Selfish Gene, by uh, making a similar point that we must, re I think the final words of the first edition of The Selfish Gene were, we alone on earth can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators. You also uh, wrote that uh, nature is, is neither kind nor cruel, but indifferent. So in the discussion then uh, of what uh, makes man, uh, the old discussion of genes of environment, you say it's, it's both. Well, uh, Darwin, I think, used the word cruel in, in his original, and that's fine. But of course, Darwin would really have meant um, indifferent. Nature isn't deliberately cruel, but the result is cruel because nature has no interest in whether the antelope feels pain when it's caught by the lion. Um, that's of no interest to nature. Um, this is just the way things will turn out if natural selection works the way it does. You can expect to see a lot of pain. There will be a lot of pain, and there is. And, and we are the result of a combination of that inheritance, that generic inheritance, from nature and, and what society gives us. We combine both. We combine we both, yes, and we are unique in that respect, I think. People are more or less familiar by now with, with the concept of genes, of course, uh, our biological inheritance, but you developed a, a, a parallel concept of uh, memes, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. What is a, a meme? Uh, well, a meme is the genetic equivalent in the cultural um, sphere. So it is a unit of cultural inheritance, and it might be something like an idea, or a tune, or a clothes fashion, or a religion, perhaps even, I mean, maybe a religion is more like a kind of complex of memes. Um, the only point of developing it, and I developed this a long time ago in The Selfish Gene, my first book, was to uh, downplay any suggestion that it's got to be genes that are the basis of Darwinian selection. What's got to be the basis of Darwinian selection is replicators. Anything that replicates will do. Genes replicate, but memes replicate too. Since I wrote The Selfish Gene, computer viruses have become very um, commonplace. And a computer virus is a very good example of a replicator. It, it makes copies of itself. It copies itself from one computer to another. It spreads exponentially as it goes from starting in one computer to two, to four, etc., and spreading outwards. Um, that's a very good example of a replicator. I wanted to make the point to my readers of The Selfish Gene, who've just read a whole book about genes, that it, isn't, it hasn't got to be DNA, it hasn't got to be genes. Anything that self-replicates will do the job of being the basis for Darwinian selection. So something like an idea that has great survival value, an idea like belief in life after death, which spreads because people like the idea and because they tell their children about it, who tell their children about it, who tell their children about it. So although there's no evidence for it, it spreads because it, it, it has high spreadability. It has it's high like survival value. what you call also a mind virus. It's like a mind virus, yes. Yeah. Uh, a new book out called The Closing of the Western Mind uh, talks about the rise of faith and the fall of reason. It denounces the growth of irrationality. Uh, do you see a trend towards irrationality? In I'm not very good at seeing trends. I'm not very confident in my ability to do so. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I could easily imagine being persuaded that there is a trend towards irrationality. I do get upset by... Um, the enormous number of people who take things like astrology seriously and religion. But I don't know of any very good evidence that there's any increase in that kind of irrationality. You mentioned uh, in the case of, of religion that religious opinion want to be respected simply because they are religious. You know, is, that, is that your main well, argument? Well, it is a bit mysterious that we do, even those of us who are not religious, are expected to treat with great deep respect 
religious beliefs. And so in our society, and I'm almost sure in Brazilian society as well, um, if there is some difficult moral issue being talked about, like abortion or um, cloning or some, something of that sort, you can more or less guarantee that among the people rounded up to talk about it, say on television, will be prominently religious spokesmen. So if there's a television program about cloning or about contraception or about abortion or something of that sort, the television company will almost certainly bring into the studio a bishop or a rabbi. Um, because somehow society is expected to listen to such people, not because they've got something worthwhile to say, but because they are spokesmen of religious traditions. And I did, there is an essay called Dolly and the Clothheads in A Devil's Chaplain, which attacks this automatic respect. I don't mind people having respect if, if it's deserved, but there's a kind of automatic respect for religion. You can't insult somebody's religion the way you are perfectly entitled to insult their politics. So you can say, I think communism stinks, or I think conservatism stinks. But you can't say, I think Christianity stinks. Um, you're just not allowed to. We, we just don't do that. You can't point out the, the historical errors in, in the Bible if it's taken literally, you know, that the man yeah. only exists for mm -hmm. 6,000 years yes. and so on. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Well, I, I mean that, but more than that. I, I mean the whole culture of exaggerated respect for religion over and above the respect we automatically have for each other. I mean, if, you're, if, if you have different politics to me, I mean, say you're a supporter of George W. Bush, then I would argue with you and you would argue with me, and that would be fine. But there's no culture that says, oh, you're not allowed to disagree with somebody's politics. Of course you disagree with somebody's politics, and you say what you think. You say, I think, I think your politics are rubbish. And you, you say, you think my politics are rubbish, and that's fine, that's accepted. But we're not allowed to do that about our religion. That's the point I'm making. In, uh, as an evolutionist, as a Darwinist, and a non-believer uh, in, an, in an afterlife, uh, what do you think then is, is the goal of life? Is it just life itself? The goal of life is life itself in the sense of reproduction. It is um, propagation of genes. Now that's of course very different from the personal goals which we in our minds set up. And you and I both set up in our minds personal goals. Um, I want to finish a book that I'm writing. Um, I, um, one might say I want to um, marry a certain woman, or I want to um, uh, write a symphony. There are all sorts of personal goals that we have, which are not the goals of life. And I would interpret them as manifestations of a capacity that the brain has to set up goals and follow them, which in our wild ancestors had a role to play. In nature, one would set up goals to find a water hole, to um, capture a buffalo. And the, the mechanism that our brains possess for setting up a goal of that sort, and that which was built into us by the ultimate natural selection goal of propagating genes, that mechanism of setting up goals to do things like catch buffaloes is now still in our brains, but it's been diverted into other goals, such as finishing a book, writing a symphony, or marrying a particular person.